the processing of wool, or more rarely silk, in order to produce yarn for weaving items for trousseaus and or clothing at the loom, was a common practice, at least until the beginning of the 20th century. Thus, most households had looms. In order to process wool and turn it into yarn, weavers used a carder, i.e. an instrument for carding fibers. The card had a flat surface with lots of small pins or wire teeth on which the wool was placed. Then the weaver would sit on the instrument's horizontal oblong extension in order to hold the surface steady with her weight. Next, she would apply another wide piece of wood, which also had small pins or wire teeth on its bottom surface, to the wool and thus card it. Then she would take the wool off the carder and place it on the spindle. The weaver would spin the spindle in order to slowly form the yarn and then, after much spinning, turn it into an evenly twisted yarn. Around the mid-20th century, however, ready-made yarn was readily available in the market. The weaver then wound the yarn into balls ready to be used at the reel. Dyeing took place during this phase, using natural dyes such as poppies for red and walnut leaves for green. Black and white were the natural colors of sheep wool. Later, ready-made yarn came in a wide selection of colors. During the next phase, the weaver unwound the ball of yarn, forming loops using her forearm and her elbow. These loops of yarn were placed on a reel. Then she would tie one end of the yarn to the canes, fastened to a spinning wheel. By turning the crank of the spinning wheel, the yarn coiled around the canes, which she would use in the next phase during the winding of the warp. Winding a warp required a warping frame made of rods, usually inserted in a wall. The canes with the coiled yarns were placed on the rods. At the bottom end of the rods hung some kind of a weight, usually stones in a net, used to keep the rods balanced, straight and aligned with one another. Then the weaver would pull a thread of yarn from each cane in a specific order she herself defined by numbering the canes. For example, by initially pulling a white thread and then a black one, she defined the alternation of colors in the textile. Then she wound all the threads together around the warping board sticks inserted in the wall at a specific distance from one another. The total length of the thread wound on the warping board defined the length of the textile to be woven. The threads had to be turned the opposite way at the last and lowest stick and be tied at the next to last stick in order to form a fork, known as a crossing. The crossing was necessary in order to hold the threads during the weaving at the loom. At the end of this process, the weaver would mark the crossing with a piece of cloth and then she would take the ready threads or warp off the frame and make a straight braid for the loom and go on with the threading of the threads of yarn through the heddles. The warp winding and the threading of the heddles was usually done by specialized and experienced women whereas weavers took over only the final stage of weaving. Here is how the heddles were threaded with the warp. They would take the end of the braid, which had no fork, and pass it through the special holes of the horizontal stick at the bottom end of the loom, known as the lower beam. To avoid the tightening of the threads when they stretch them along the length of the loom, they place canes between the threads. Then, to make sure that the threads remained in the same order and that the chosen design would occur, they opened up the threads. In order not to miss the fork or crossing or have it get tangled up, they placed canes which kept it steady. The other end of the threads having a fork were threaded through the heddles. The heddles had a particular double knot which helped distinguish the threads into upper and lower ones and to maintain the crossing along the full length of the loom. After threading the yarn through the heddles, they also passed them through the reed. The reed kept the threads in their position, not allowing them to shrink or expand. Then the threads were tied to the horizontal stick at the upper part of the loom, known as the upper beam. Then followed the main process of weaving. Using the special pedals or treadles, which were tied to the heddles, the weavers moved the heddles up and down, 
Every heddle going up opened the crossing and separated the threads, half up and half down, creating a space called a shed. Then the weaver passed the shuttle with a weft thread through the shed, crossing the warp threads. Beating the weft thread strongly with the reed, the weaver caused it to tighten on the upper beam of the loom. Then she pressed the treadles again to raise the other warp threads and open the shed and pass the shuttle with the weft thread through it before beating it into place. This process continued until the textile cloth being woven was completed. The heddles and the reed were fixed on the upper part of the loom in special notches in a way that suited the weaver. As the process went on, the warp threads were stretched more and more, and therefore at some point the weaver would stop the weaving process, take off the brake release, i.e. a long stick used as a brake to stop the rotation of the lower beam, and turn the lower beam over in order to loosen the warp threads. Then she would place the brake release back into its position and continue weaving.